without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Aya, Melissa, and Anwar, who not only designed content for this talk, but also put a lot of thinking into the format. So over to you. Thank you so much, Dorothea, for introducing um, this platform and for introducing us. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. So today we're going to be speaking about flexibility, food work, and quantum exams. Um, only last week on uh, Tuesday, we concluded one general training uh, with Syrian refugees and Romanians um, in one of the universities um, in our York City, um, which is um, a city in Jordan. It's going to be more self police and now we're going to briefly introduce the project um, and then we're going to uh, start with our own talks. Um, so PTE for Refugees um, is a collaboration between different partners. One of them is University of Sheffield, University of Petra, where I'm coming from, um, and University of um, Arts in London, of London Arts, I can never pronounce <laughs> it in the right order, uh, and University of Albury together with UNHCR. And uh, PTE stands for Personal Protection Equipment for Refugees, and it was a pool based on previous collaborations between UNHCR and the University of Sheffield, mainly by Tony and Fred, uh, story. Um, and the call was to assess in this emergency um, that happened due to the pandemic. So how do we work? We work through three main working groups, the social working group, the technical working group, and the digital working group. We ourselves today, myself, Melissa, and Anwar, we stand to speak about the social working group experience. We have other colleagues working at the technical working group and the digital working group who have been part also in a way of um, uh, is that they were important in that general. What is PAR? We're going to be referring uh, quite often in this talk to PARs. And by PAR, first of all, as, you, as many of you may be familiar, Okay, as many of you may be familiar, uh, PAR stands for Participatory Action Research, and whenever we mention it in our talk today, it is to refer to uh, participatory action researchers who have been recruited and trained um, in this uh, training. All right, so we're trying to, so one of, the main, one of the main calls that our project is trying to address and respond to is the problem of livelihoods uh, that have been uh, terribly hit in Jordan uh, through many sectors. Um, and what we're trying to do is to address ways through participation and through these different social working, uh, three, these three different working groups on how can we possibly find ways with people following a participatory action research approach to address and to respond to this, um, to the pandemic and how it has affected livelihoods. So we're following a plan for a training. We're, we started with general training, uh, which we're going to be speaking about today. Uh, we're planning for the advanced training on which we're going to be requesting your advice um, in the second part of, this, of today's workshop and um, any input on long term um, if you have any. It's because it is something that we continuously think of once we leave this project, once it's concluded, um, how are we going to be um, still um, leaving something that people can work with after we leave. So here's a brief diagram uh, for a table for the training. So we, we had the training started on 27th of September. Um, it was about under, understanding participatory action research, uh, research uh, what it means. Uh, we wanted to bring everyone on board on that. The second part is understanding geographies of pandemic, um, ethics and uh, data protection. As I said, it's the three working groups actually contributing to this table. And then methods of social, digital, and technical methods. Um, and then how to design interventions. So now we're going to start by um, introducing the three main themes uh, around which we're going to be share our reflections. If you bear with us, we're going to be telling you a form of stories. Um, and we thought that the three themes that we would like to um, crystallize our thoughts around our promises and lies, trajectories and ambitions, and on positionalities. Okay, so I'm going to start. If I may ask you please to, to mute your mics. Thank you. 
In an attempt to document the day, which happens to be the last day of the training, I opened the notes up on my phone and brought flyers. This came during a bus ride from the five-star hotel in which we were staying in Jabal Amman to Al Bayt University in Amakrab city, where we conduct the training on particularly action research with Syrian refugees and Jordanians of marginalized communities. I had flipped through the radio channels to find something to entertain us on the way. That moment in which I wrote down the title of the note flyers coincided with the conclusion that we, the listeners, reached about the general character of the songs played by the radio, which is called Radio Dalet Channel. With a hidden fervor, we sat waiting for the end of each song, anticipating how the next song might continue the theme. As soon as the music would start playing and the singers started to sing, we would turn to each other with eyes narrow or widely open, guessing the new song with excitement. In a casual witness, with the, which the formality of our few first journeys had not allowed, the driver joined us in our game. It seemed that someone had lied to the DJ and did not give him his salary, the driver said. I asked the driver to slow down so we could finish our game with the DJ at Radio Ballot. He slowed down. It occurred to me that Uday, the driver, had really liked our company. Moving in a very slow and soothing motion that allowed for unshaken sips of coffee, he moved into the right lane of four slower traffic. Neither of us wanted the journey to end. However, fate had decided otherwise. Fate or the flattering radio waves in the vast desert of Mufraq disrupted the radio transmission a few minutes before we reached the university. From there, we rushed to, re to reach AABU, Alan Bate University, eventually arriving on time. Sung by male and female pop singers of different eras, the lyrics of the song carried messages of reproach between two lovers. The blame in every song necessarily leads to one of two ends, either an intimate reconciliation or an eternal rupture. Yet the ups and downs in music and melodies were suggestive of what's not being said, which is referred to maybe as political negotiations. For example, in her song, Your Lies Are Sweet, his back hero, Mayada Basri says, the best thing about you, what keeps me attached to you is that your lies are kind of believable. Yeah, stay as you are. She knows that lying is an inherent characteristic of her lover, yet it is his lying that keeps her attached to him. Her lover's ability to be believed is related to her desires and expectations. Her future becoming in this love is founded in her dependency on what he says, on what he promises. When she says to him, yeah, stay as you are, we don't fully understand if what she means is real or if she too is lying, meaning that she's mocking his life and the expected estrangement that led to it. The playlist of layers was still playing in my head when one of our cars asked me a question on lies. On that day, we spoke to our cars about the plans for the advanced training. We spoke about field work, data collection, and how we will be doing our best to facilitate their knowledge in the field to make livelihoods. When we knock on people's doors, people will ask us about the use of this project to them. How are we going to respond? He followed his question. I mean, we cannot go there without having a planned response, and we cannot use livelihoods without truly really understanding their needs. Otherwise, they would think of us as liars. In a previous discussion that I had with one of our interns, he warned of our cars. He warned us against our frequent use of the word livelihood and explained that what livelihood means to the local community are three big things, job opportunities, funding for small projects, and training courses. Our peers have indeed a meticulous understanding of our field of inquiry, and their questions, to which they definitely have answers, they exercise a kind of political maneuver, as if our peers were testing our knowledge and familiarity with the field that falls under their expertise. Participation is an essential component of what we do, and this is in a way comforting. If we think of our role as regular researchers or conventional researchers, those questions would have brought us much embarrassment, actually. Soon I utilize this component on participation to negotiate their questions and justify why I do not necessarily have responses. We don't make promises, we try through you. I found a way out to negotiate their questions. On our way back from, from Al Bay to the Five Star Hotel where we were staying, I turned on the radio again. This time, it was a song called Promised, now wrote. The lyrics of those songs say, Promised, promised of torment, oh my heart, promised of wounds, oh my heart, you would never calm down, 
you would never rest on my heart. And there we play. Thank you, Aya. So that was just a little snippet of one of our rides on the very last day of training going home um, with that song home um, about promises. Um, so now you've, you've taken a little bit of that traffic, very heavy traffic uh, journey with us. Um, so now I'm going to add to what Aya uh, shared about the last day of training. I'm going to take it a few days before that and look at the second half day of training, um, second to last day of training. Um, so in the second half of the general training, Par has attended sessions on social science research methods. The first session of the day was led by Ayo on behalf of the social pillar. And a few slides into the introduction on social science research methods presentation, um, Par has initiated an intense discussion on the difference between qualitative and quantitative research. I watched from the side as Aya moderated this discussion. And all three of us, Anwar, myself, and Aya, are qualitative researchers. And yet it soon became clear that many of the PARs had little understanding of qualitative research, both the methods, but more importantly, also the outputs. One PAR researcher raised his hand to share that he believed even qualitative data ultimately becomes analyzed and presented as quantitative data, which made my qualitative part dribble a little bit here. Um, but this made me think back to my PhD research. So from over a year of participant observation and semi-structured interviews, I had built an argument that was complex, but also in some ways abstract, looking at time in a refugee camp and feelings and emotions around time. I could not have arrived at these types of conclusions without qualitative data. There is power in narration, as we're trying to practice today as well, in observing the unsaid and analyzing the unexpected. But how do we teach this in this type of setting, in this type of training? If we could show PARS an example of an ethnographic chapter, I thought, then they could more confidently locate qualitative research. But even then, how could we show how the process of qualitative research informed that example without PARS having actually experienced the research process itself? So I suddenly felt very overwhelmed. I think we all did. We had a moment of extreme overwhelm. Um, realizing that entire courses and degrees are designed around teaching social science research methods, but we have a matter of months. So it occurred to me that here we are training PARs to become social science researchers, and the PARs would be conducting research as they learned the very process of social science research itself. So in a matter of months, could we really expect PARs to become fully equipped researchers, not just in the field, conducting interviews, distributing surveys, but also the harder part, arguably the harder part, which is what comes after, critically analyzing the data and challenging their own perceptions and vocabularies. The PARs are eager to learn and practice research, and we saw this during the training, and I have no doubt that through the process they will grow as researchers, but it made me think what promises are we making about their futures as researchers. And now we're gonna pass it on to Anwar Kwene to share her reflections. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. From ref reflecting upon the expectations um, uh, about what parts we're expecting from us in terms of applying like a participatory action research within them. So I'm reflecting upon the feedback that, we, that me and Melissa uh, run every morning to take some like reflections about how the previous day uh, went. And one of the most important comments that we received, and we were actually very thrilled to be receiving, is that they're not feeling the presence of a dominance power 
um, in the in, in, in uh, during the training. Um, so whether intentionally or not intentionally, we were able to, uh, to acknowledge the voices of the bars in a way where they didn't feel like they were muted or uh, diminished. And we were actually being able to use the bar approach in order to, to break down this underlying power imbalances between us and them and um, to dismantle some unequal power relations that might exist uh, in the environment. I also wanted to refer about the some speculations and doubts uh, of my own, which was also raised by one of our bars. It's like one of the bars raised his hand and uh, requested some more theoretical knowledge, references and case studies in order to improve like his um, his knowledge about the training. So that's that's make me some speculant around uh, where we like over planning or too ambitious about the skills that we're hoping the bars will gain after the training, and whether these skills are able to be applicable in the field while they were conducting their researches. Um, it also made me wonder about the disparity between the bars in in terms of their research capacities, skills, and capabilities, and whether our research material were able to be accessed fully to all bars as equals. And one last point I wanted to refer is, which was mainly a concern by all bars, is their not knowing of what's next and referring to what's, what our job roles would be. And this makes me wonder uh, if, um, like the bars with this diverse capabilities, research capabilities, been able to reflect upon their own experiences and their own skills in order to utilize these skills in their future researches or the new future uh, research ideas that they're hoping to, um, to pursue during the uh, next three months. Um, uh, so yeah, I think this is, this is was the main concerns or reflections that falls under the umbrella for promises and lies that we uh, wanted to reflect upon from using the bar voices and not mine. So thank you. Thank you, Anwar. Okay, so now we're moving to the um, to the second part. I may ask you, Anwar, to um, everybody else to mute, please. It's the fifth day of the training, and it is still not possible to remember the 36 names of the course. This is okay. However, I saved a lot of names. Malik, Ali, Dalrid, Rahda, Noor, Ahmad, Mayar, Salem, Asil, Omar, Abu Salah, Miyassar, Sadiq, Amani. However, one name in particular was difficult to recall. For some reason, the name did not settle in my memory, despite its simplicity and good connotations. Jabir, his name is Jabir, G-A-B-E-R. With a spontaneity that some may describe as naivety, my imagination had given him another name, with some letters adjusting themselves around the J and replacing other letters. A complex and a quick mind process in which the scientific mixes with the psychological to name things by their meanings. On that morning of the training, I asked a question to our trainees, Hands were raised for participation. Among these was Jabbers. I addressed him and said, go ahead, Naja. The rest seized the opportunity and hurried to correct me. Doctora, Doctora, his name is Jabber. I quickly settled the matter by sharing with him why Naja seemed like a name that could be used to address him. I know that your name is not Naja. But do you know why my imagination chose this name for you? Your presence, your enthusiasm, and your willingness always suggest to me that you have a share of success, that your name Najah, that your name is Najah, which means the successful. During the six day training, Najah was committed to the time of attendance, being the first to show up and the last to leave. The image of his iron shirt and pants and leather handbag endowed our training with a touch of formality. In a way, it made me feel more responsible for what we delivered and how we planned our training. Like many in the audience, Najah embodied a high degree of ambition, 
hoping that his commitment and learning would bring him slightly closer to his dream. Later on, the name Najah enabled an intimate space through which Jabir felt that he could reveal to me his dreams for the future. He received my justification around his new name happily with a wide smile, then asked me if he could speak to me in private. He told me his story, how he fled, fled from Syria and how his life became suspended in the camp. Not only between the past and the present, he felt that the fate of his life hinges on someone else's decision. This is the reality of asylum and the reality of humanitarian technocracy. Those big scissors that claim the collective interests, so they go astray in trimming the hopes of those dreamers like Najah. Najah wants to become a university professor in a computing major. By talking to me about his struggle, he, he was also very cautious, as, as though he wanted me to help him. But he did not ask for help, for the fear of something I might not have known. Or, um, I went from the phone. Thank you, Aya. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to bring us to the very first uh, day of training, the very first activity. Um, we had cars pick cards from three different boxes to get them moving around and, and um, holding things, tangible things. Um, that they would then use to introduce themselves to others. It was an icebreaking activity. So one box had cards that um, okay. Um, so one box had cards describing work professions and sectors. The second described their specialization, like their degree, for example. And the third, a fun one, was birth months and zodiacs, um, zodiac signs. So a few minutes into the activity, one of the cars approached me and asked what she should pick for her second card, as she did not attend university and so does not have a specialization. I responded that she should choose one that's based on her interests or what she might have specialized in if she were to attend university. And this response was met with confusion, as it seemed that she could not imagine an alternative trajectory in which she pursued a specialization. So instead, she merely thanked me and quickly returned to her table without a second card. So this instance reminded me of the interview process for this project in which Aya and I, um, as well as representatives from the UNHCR, interviewed around 49 candidates for 30 car positions. So one of the questions I asked each candidate was, how do you see this project fitting in your future career plans? And while some had a clear idea of their career trajectory, exactly how it fits, what they're going to do next, uh, what they want to learn, many of the interviews had a less solid vision. The CVs that we looked at were filled with certificates received in similar programs in the humanitarian sectors, but actual job opportunities resulting from such certificates were scarce. So while we are here encouraging cars to imagine otherwise, imagine an alternative life trajectory, all of them occupy a more rigid reality in which options are actually quite limited. So the training, while an empowering exercise, or at least intended to be an empowering exercise, is merely one part of just the job, or one of a few, for some of the parts. Alongside questions about social science research and geographies of the pandemic were more tangible questions. So what do you mean by livelihoods, as I was uh, talking about before? How many hours can we work on our contract? Um, the big question, what happens after February 20th, 2022, which is the last uh, day of the project. We're also engaging with cars of various skill levels. So some have conducted research before and have some experience. Others have less experience, but a lot of potential and passion. So how do we continue to build their capacities without leaving others behind? How can we cultivate equitable livelihood opportunities? So considering the various limitations confronting cars based on nationality, resident status, age, and gender, for example. And at what point does our active encouraging ambition set the stage for broken promises? And that's me. So Anwad, would you like to add your reflection? Thank you, Melissa. So I'm quoting this from one of our bars when we were having this coffee break when she told me, I'm not trying to be a philosopher here, but I think anything that addresses the material, the moral and the spiritual aspects always work. So this made me mindful about 
how the harmony between the three groups were working, both us, the social groups, the digital and the technical group. And by saying that, she referred to the compatibility between the three groups while working together and how, how, how they, how many bars like have this primary vision of how to utilize the skills and the knowledge that they gain or hoping to gain from the project in order to seek a decent livelihood. And she referred to one of the uh, bars who had this, this laboratory experience and wanted to start her own small workshop and seeking opportunities by asking, for example, Dr. Mohanad of how she is going to be able to do that. It's like giving them, uh, giving them hope that they have never like dreamed of. Uh, but this is only by reflecting on the voc vocational like aspects uh, that we are hoping to gain from the project. But she also referred to this research side. I mean, most of our bars like have this highly experienced in, in, in research and they attend uh, and they may have been part of many researchers and the trainings. So she was thrilled that this, um, the training would help her to gain like a name in a larger research projects and projects, research project with higher profiles and have her name written down on some national or international um, uh, journals. So this was uh, one of the reflections that I uh, wanted to uh, reflect upon. But also maybe this is, was mentioned by uh, Melissa and um, Aya, is the one comment that we received on the piece of cotton when we asked about the concerns of the um, of the concerns of the project, and one uh, written down like, uh, how do you want us to perceive like livelihoods? Because for them, uh, seeking livelihood as refugees with vulnerabilities may be different from others. So this may raise the questions of how or what spectrum um, does the project uh, place the term livelihood? And how do they expect the bars to receive? Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And more. For a long time, this contract was only a burden. First, the idea of the mortgage that weighed on my chest. And secondly, the idea of returning to a world to which I no longer belong. Don't worry about the mortgage. Stay where you are and solve the matter legally. Someone would say, do you know what a mortgage is? It's a plot of land that my mother and father bought when they were young. They put every shilling in their pockets to buy it. It's not only their capital, but also their homeland. Do you know what the weight of such a proposal would be on my father? It could kill him. I often wish to defend my return decision, decision with determination. But the question of return and the desire to find a way to exit the land dilemma preoccupied me for a while, just as the question of settling in the North preoccupied me. In a previous lecture this year called Critical Reflections on Ur Ur Urgent Transitions from a PhD student in the North to an assistant professor in the South, I presented some of the challenges I had experienced in the transition between the North and the South. Through this transitional stage, I mainly feared the possible lack of access to resources of research, revision, and publication on the one hand, and the loss of knowledge networks that would allow my scientific and the critical development on the other hand. I have enough local examples to increase the contraction and discomfort of my heart. A few have gracefully climbed the academic ladder, and many are still languishing at the bottom, burdened by the requirements of the institution, and somewhat satisfied, if not grateful in one way or another, with the institutional entitlements they have accomplished and received. In this transition from the north to the south, a new representation of what colonized university means. In the north, the question of color, race, ancestry, and geographic origins was central to understanding the structure and the intuitive trade-offs that shape people's consciousness about them. In the south, the matter was different, not because geographic origins did not contribute to the formation of an uneven surface of privileges, but rather because the issue of race and color was not a phenomenon or essential within the model of the university institution as it is in the South, as the model of the institution exists in the South. Civil life in the South, for example, lacks an infrastructure of active activism and a discourse of rights. Often, your access to your rights depends on a combination of factors such as family name, 
plan, class, and location. Gender certainly complicates these factors, so any discussion that seeks to change this reality often depends on the individual's understanding of his or her academic rights first, and his or her commitment to a set of multi-mutualistic values second. Apart from that, speaking about decolonizing the university, about working hours, the researchers need, and the, the intrusions of the university administration often floats on a, on a on a sticky surface of dialogue in which you feel the limits of others because you don't know if your expression of your necessary needs will threaten someone's authority. During the past year, however, my perspective differed slightly on what I call the transitional period, and my understanding of the issue of the North and the South became more complex in a way. Some research funding, such as the one which, I'm, which we are working on through this research project, the GCRF, has created the new conditions that have changed how the university model works in the South. This is because the presence of funding at the association with the university and colleagues settled in the North or the West upgrade the academic in the South. During my short time in Jordan, I worked through five research collaborations as an associate investigator, a co-investigator, with different research teams. My contract, which was a burden at first, turned into a platform through which many of these relationships were facilitated. I can speak about this more, but now I'm moving to the How many Arabic speakers do we have in the room today? One, come Steve, another. I still had this conversation. That's a Arabic? No, but, <laughs> but uh, just to see as I'm going to be using some Arabic. And I know um, in the attendee list, there are quite a few. Arabic speakers. So whenever I'm in Jordan, I must cons consistently explain that I can speak Arabic when I'm introduced to new people. Yes, I speak Arabic, I learned it in school, but I picked up the Jordanian and Syrian dialects in my work and research over the past 10 years. No, I do not have any Arab heritage, etc, etc. It's basically the same conversation every time. On this trip in particular, for the general training, it became routine for these introductory encounters to be followed by a test or a pop quiz. So in one instance, the man I was introduced to told me sabah al khair, which means good morning. And in the middle, this was in the middle of the afternoon, it was like 3 p.m., just to see if I knew what the proper response was. Place. In a very dark place, there was no sun. Um, in another instance, someone turned to me with conversation to say chief Kailich, which is how are you in a very rural colloquial accent from southern Syria. Um, which is when they pronounce certain things with, with a different Haurani, uh, yes, thank you, Osama, uh, from the Hauran region. So he wanted to see if I would understand that and respond correctly. So these quizzes were humorous and ice-breaking, but also sometimes for me they were a bit distancing, reminding me that regardless of my fluency in Arabic, I'm always, first and foremost, an outsider, an Ejbiya in Arabic, which means foreigner, which carries along with it particular perceptions and often stereotypes. So as a research associate on a project based in the global north, my work in the fields can feel like a balancing act. So I have navigated my positionality as a young, female, American, and half Puerto Rican northern researcher in similar southern contexts before, so mainly through MPhil and PhD research in Dr. Azra Camps in Jordan. And I tap into linguistic and cultural fluency in order to account for this distance that interlocutors in the field may perceive from my appearance. And it's indeed very satisfying, especially during the trainings, to be able to have participated um, and build interpersonal connections because of this linguistic ability and uh, cultural understanding. While I was able to participate in trainings because of the language, for example, there is still no avoiding the danger of the white savior complex. And I'm always hyper aware of the weight that my presence holds in an environment like that of the training. So during the training, this was sometimes an uncomfortable uh, position to navigate. And especially given the short time of the general training, it was over about seven days, I did not want to intrude in the space for Southern colleagues like Aya, but also others from um, Ellen Bates University to carry out the training, to implement it, while also wanting to provide support for the training and to meaningfully engage with the course for myself. So I found for me, the best way of engaging with the PARs was in small group discussions when I was able to circulate around the room and have more intimate conversations with PARs in which I can more easily navigate power dynamics. 
In larger group settings, I focused instead on providing support for Aya and for um, Anwa, who would be the ones who would stay, continuing the work on the ground in the field after I returned to Sheffield. So this is exhibited in pictures from the general training that we have uh, that have been on the slide so far, uh, which focus on Aya and Anwa implementing the training taken by myself from behind the camera. Uh, beyond the quick general training, I do feel that the length of your advanced training will provide a more comfortable setting for me to step into more direct implementation as needed. The shared theme of the various positionalities in the training room is precarity. So during the first year of the pandemic, I experienced the precarity of being a newly minted PhD in a very rapidly changing job landscape. Um, so when I began my full-time work on this project, I transitioned into a different type of precarity employed but on a very short contract. So along with the PARS, I also often worried about what's next. Will I be able to line something up for after the project ends on February 20th, 2022? Uh, also as an academic on a UK skilled worker migrant visa that ends on the exact same end date as the project does, I constantly think about my precarious immigration status here. So throughout the training, these questions about post-project plans, for me, many of them were internal, but for the PARS external, sometimes interfered in our productivity in the present. But it is challenging to produce and perform an unstable present as we've seen kind of throughout the pandemic. So anticipation and anxiety around the future are unavoidable and defining themes of this project for myself and also most others in the training room in a various different ways. And then finally, as a scholar of time, I consistently reflect on the politics of time, not just for those in the field, but also for myself. So what does it mean to fly in for a short 10-day period uh, for the week-long general training and then fly out again? What kinds of connections can be made in the remaining months of the project? And with the inevitable delays that come with such large research projects, how do I stick to the promises that were made by me by nearly stepping into the training? Um, that's it. So, Anwar, would you like to? So, for my positionality, I wanted to reflect upon the dominance of foreign power, which is from my my personal observation as a woman and a teacher assistant in the room. There was some clear, louder voices for women in the space, almost as equal as the men voices um, in the room, and. Women highly engaged and participated fully during the training. And one, one point also is what is, that was the mixed gendered group and we mixed gendered groups actually worked well and better than I personally expected. I initially like, um, have initial perception about the dominance of women's power, you know, taking the lead, uh, while we were delivering the social training. With the presence of like Helen and uh, Laura in the back, me and Melissa in the front, and Aya like taking the lead, which might resulted with uh, women taking advantage of uh, the women's power, um, taking hands in terms of like with the possession of power, and um, making creating a room for them like to engage uh, fully and even better than one might expect might expect. Uh, however. I wanted to reflect on about the triangular power dynamics that I wasn't really uh, fully aware of. Uh, it was when Aya gave me the opportunity of delivering one of the training. Um, uh, one day which I was like fully happy about and I think that I did well while delivering this training. However, once I finished, I took some feedback from the bars, like how the training went, what do you think of the material? And suddenly I found them reflecting upon me as an RA, like how I acted, how I behaved, when, when the times when I uh, took control and lost control. And this made me conscious and mindful about how my position as an RA and a co-I or research associate might put me in, um, in, a, in a space of a social vulnerability or, or a social risk of being evaluated by others. This was important like to keep in mind if I am about to deliver the trainings in, for example, in the advanced training and how that might affect the research um, process and with the bars would take the RAs like seri as serious as the co-eyes or the associates. And it's also important to re-reflect upon 
uh, while I will be delivering the general training for the for the bars in Saturday, because this triangular power dynamics between the researchers, the bars, and the RA won't exist since, for example, Melissa won't be there and perhaps Aya won't be there. So this one, this one, um, this position of mine that I wanted to reflect upon. Okay, as for insider, outsider. As an RA that I wasn't there when the interviews happen and the recruitment happen, and I was only able to meet the bars at the first day of the training, I wanted to reflect upon how the bars might perceive me, which might be as an outsider. And also I might be perceived by the other researchers and, uh, and as an outsider. But for me, I somehow position myself uh, like this external insider. And by doing that, I refer to my past experience uh, while working with um, Syrian refugees, while conducting my my master's degree and working in a previous research project that also targets Syrian refugees. And somehow I prefer um, which this uh, um, this position of mine is expected to be reasonable because I or I somehow um, part it in the ground of logic because I share some commonalities with them. Some, for example, the cultural background we share with the Syrian refugees, especially people from Haran, and uh, also the dialect, which was like like a signature of mine because one or maybe two to three bars like refer to my dialect and how it speaks, which make them comfortable while communicating with me. Now, uh, last but not least, um, is the gender, of course, that I wanted to reflect upon. So I have to admit that I was somehow biased to the uh, female groups. That was before we had this mixed gender group where there actually was a division in the room between um, the uh, female groups and the male groups. So uh, for some reason, I felt more comfortable having these random uh, dialogues and conversations with the females more than I have uh, with when I was approaching like the male groups. But I didn't feel like comfortable and uh, being myself around them. So Melissa with her observ observational eyes, like she noticed that and came to me and told me, you know, why are, are you doing this? So this incident make me, be make me become more conscious about how my actions might undermine the principle of bar and how discriminatory my actions and beliefs might be toward men. So I learned that being uncritical about the role of the gender might affect um, uh, the unequal distribution benefits for the participant. And this is where I feel like there is an urgent need to readjust my positions for all bars, where I have to intentionally address my privileges and actions um, uh, and be conscious and make this conscious effort to view men as equals. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. So just one more time because you're on mute. So that's um, our reflections. And I guess we'll take questions for, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. I know people have to leave. And then we'll have a break and go into the workshop aspect. If people online want to stay for the workshop, then please do. Okay. Well, I think I've probably speak for many in the room to kind of say that that was absolutely fascinating. And um, thank you also for um, taking a storytelling approach. Because um, I, I think it does allow us ways in um, which otherwise is just not spoken enough in the academy. Um, so thank you for that. And I think we'll probably need some time to digest over also into the break and into the workshop. But if there are any immediate um, questions or comments that would like to make. Maybe we will take, you know, five minutes or so, possibly ten, depending on how much people have to say. Um, just respond immediately. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Rasan, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to really thank you for this workshop and everything going on so far. And uh, 
I, I wanted to ask a question in regards to how did you guys feel yourself when you were doing this uh, um, sort of research and you were saying that, oh, okay, I have this dialect uh, of a uh, Horani dialect. I feel like I am an insider. Uh, how did this uh, benefit you? Or did you feel that this was uh, uh, a benefit and a curse at the same time? Or was it really good in all aspects of the research that you, the training, was everybody more um, acquainted with you in this regard? Thank you, Osama. Okay, so for me, it was, for example, my dialect was the best of both worlds, let's say. Uh, it was good for me to communicate and to have these intimate conversations and even communicate with the bars like uh, behind, this, behind the scenes and a asking for reflections and taking the conversation like deeper than the project and so on. But at the same time, for some reason, I felt like the way I positioned myself with this dialect and this cultural background that I share with them uh, is that my my role as an RA is won't be taken like seriously just because the idea that I fit it in within this within this um, let's say environment. So this reflection came after, but I think if we if we're talking about benefits, it was a benefit for me more than it was a burden. So I think I hope I, by by that I'm answering your question. So I'm yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anwar, and also for some of your question. I think we've got time for maybe one, maximum two more questions, so we have some time for the workshop. I've got Helen's um, uh, question and also Mara. Helen, would you like to go first? Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's been fantastic to be able to hear all three of you today. Um, uh, in having been there part of the time and come back, it felt like a really missing part of the picture. So thank you. Um, one of the things that you might imagine I'm hypersensitive to is the areas that you've all spoken to uh, equally, if not differently, around expectations and broken promises. Um, and as the project moves closer to the livelihoods aspect of it, do you either collectively or individually have a sense of how we can continue without breaking hearts? What's quite interesting from my observation is that they, our employees really understand the game and they understand also the game of, uh, what, of what we do, of livelihoods, and they, they can guide us through it. Um, I think this, this reminds me of the interview process, so we went to school these interviews and we interviewed Jordanians um, uh, from Mafia City and we interviewed senior refugees from outside the camp and from inside the camp. And they were so much so much a culture to the humanitarian culture. So whenever we have we have this list of questions based on the experiences <laughs> we have <laughs> their CVs. And so many of them had had experiences working with the humanitarian agencies. So they are familiar with this and it is kind of their language. So I think we're not going to be breaking any part of breaking hearts, but we really need them uh, to guide us through what are the trajectories of livelihoods that may be satisfying for them. Uh, so yeah, this is my, now they're finished, so go <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I had to turn it off. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a great question, Helen, obviously the conversations that are ongoing. I would say the biggest thing for me is to make sure that we're constantly communicating. So, making sure that we are checking in with the cars and letting know what's going on the updates that we are still very much our hearts are in it but for example maybe there are some structural issues that are going on um, and i think they're, they're very understanding and we, we had these conversations with them where we basically said we don't know everything right now we don't have all the answers the idea that i as well in the reflection the idea is that we're working with you to uh, kind of navigate through this together and issues that come up. So I think for me, a big one is communication. Communication, I think there was very much a value for love in the space. So I think there was this vibe of really working together. Um, yeah, and that, that was 
like this mutual mutuality, mutual respect, mutual uh, understanding. I think there was this vibe. Right. I think there's a lot there to unpack that we could also carry on and maybe also carry into the workshop. There was Maha, Maha. Have yes, I've got Maha on, on next, okay. um, our next our next speaker. So just to say we will probably have quite a few issues that are you know that, that we may want to also carry on into the workshop space. So um Dr. Maha, please. Uh, hello everyone, it was really nice to be part of this uh, lovely, let me say, lesson in life. Uh, well, it was, uh, I've got many questions to ask, but let me summarize them or maybe just pick the important one and, and ask it. I was just wondering about the interviews you made to, uh, with the participants that were part of this uh, project. What, what was the criteria that you used to, to pick them up? Or was it just, uh, you know, a, a get to know interview or to be familiar with the participants? Or there, or, or there was a criteria to pick the ones that was accepted in the, uh, in this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. So lovely to see you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, it's, it's a very long process actually, the interviews, um, just to give you a background, so this is a fund that was, it's, it's a, a collaboration with the UNHCR, uh, the University of Sheffield, uh, University of Edinburgh, University of Tokyo. Um, so interviews happened through, mainly through the UNHCR, so we and the University of Edinburgh, our partners, and there was, so these are job opportunities, so the funding that we received is actually to recruit these people on the training and to have them, uh, the training is like a job for them, so um, so when we announced for this job, um, we followed the routes that are already existing within the UNHCR, for example, when they announced for a job, what kind of, um, what kind of recruitment criteria they have, so there were well, there was already structures through which we navigated and we tried to follow. Uh, so we posted two main announcements: an announcement for speaking about the social, like taking also into consideration that the set of skills that we need for a social researcher is different than the set of skills we need for a digital researcher and for a technical researcher. So that's in mind. Um, we also navigated through the UNHCR already uh, established forms of announcements. We made this announcement according to the UNHCR, but also outside for our Jordanians. Um, speaking of the social research group, some of the skills we wanted people like to, to do interviews, to have um, experience in community mobilization, um, to have work, to have been worked as a researcher. So, um, yeah, we had three posts for shortlisting some people with social work experience, some people with research experience. And some people with DG social experience. So this is uh, this response to your question, Dr. And then we follow the scale of salaries as given by our partners. Can I just add also? Um, so when we were choosing the partners, we made sure that we were also taking into account the opportunities that different people have had based on their nationality, gender, age, for example. So we we wanted a good mix of people with lots of experience, but also people who had the passion, obviously, maybe had a lot of volunteer experience and had a lot of potential. So the idea was to kind of balance that out to form amongst them a good, a good mix of people who learn from each other. Um, so a lot of thought went into this. There were a lot of criteria. Um, and uh, I think one of the best things about the interviews, though, was that it was, a, it was an opportunity for us to get to know them um, through that process as well. So that did obviously happen. Um, it's very fulfilling. Yeah. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much for your question. So uh, the workshop is about planning the advanced training. So now we're finished with the first stage of the training, with the, which is the general one. And it's to bring all our parts from all the working groups into one page around what are we doing, um, like about participatory reaction research, what is PPE for refugees, etc. The next training for the social team, we're having some... Um, we need your assistance, let's put it that way. Um, some of the questions we have in mind is how to co-produce a research question with our participants. Um, we're, we're having a proposal that we're going to show you at the beginning of the workshop. 
Um, so some of these questions, how to co-produce a question of research, what else do we have? We yeah. have yeah. designed some cycles of doing multiple um, cycles of research through three months, so we want your input also. But we want to see if that also speaks to some of the questions that you already have regarding your own research and how we can have discussions around that. Um, if we have enough people, depending on how many people stay online, we could do a breakout groups. Um, so we'll have to see who stays. Um, but the idea is that it's just a very casual discussion. Uh, we'll have Dorothea and Steve uh, run the breakout groups online, um, and then maybe talk together at the end to hear some of the kind of last thoughts. And it's really not only about what we're doing, it's also about what you're doing. We want to hear if some of our questions resonate with your own experiences. If you have more questions to add, that would be great. Yeah, so this is five minutes of the break art. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. So we're going to come, we're going to take a comfort break now. And at 21 past, whatever your hour it is, uh, we are we're going to come back together. Um, and in the meantime, please take a quick break, and then um, we're going to into a sort of a practical workshop space. Um, there'll be breakout groups online as well as here in the room. Um, so please do join us, and it's going to be on this channel slash at 21 past. We're going to tell you what the link for breakout group is if it's somewhere else. So stay tuned on this channel.